DVT and pulmonary embolism. So first for DVT, DVT, the name tells us everything, deep vein thrombosis, the thrombosis of blood resulting when blood clots in the deep veins of the leg. So we have deep veins, as you can see here, so that's like that's the femoral, iliac veins, popliteal veins. You don't have to memorize that, but those are the deep veins. And then we have the superficial veins. Those are like the blue lines. You might be able to see them on your own thighs and your own legs. These are the superficial veins. Now you can have clotting in both, but clotting in the deep veins is what can cause big problems. And so you get thrombosis of blood, blood clots up, obstructing it. Okay, that's that's what a deep vein thrombosis is. Now we have three major risk factors for thrombosis in general. So thrombosis in any location, blood thrombosis is three big, uh, three big risk factors. One, disruption of blood flow and blood stasis. Okay, if it's not moving, it's more likely to just stick together and form a clot. So for example, if you, if you just had a surgery and you're sitting in bed and you're immobilized, you're at risk for a blood clot. If you were on an airplane sitting there from Hong Kong to New York, for 15 hours, you're at risk for a blood clot. Because guess what? Usually, your muscles help your help your um, help the blood flow, help the blood in the veins go back to the heart. But if your muscles aren't moving because you're just sitting there on the plane watching movies, then you're at risk for a blood clot. So disruption of blood flow and blood stasis. Number one. Number two is a hypercoagulable state. So we have we normally have clotting just to help prevent bleeding. Normally, it's a normal level. It's not too active. It's only active when when you need it to be. But we can have some people can be hypercoagulable. They can be more likely to form blood clots. For example, if you're taking OCPs, the estrogen makes you more likely to form blood clots. You can also have inherited disorders or, or um, acquired disorders. So something like a factor V laden that makes you more likely to form blood clots. Factor V laden is one of the most common inherited hypercoagulable disorders. Okay. So if you're a hyper hypercoagulable state, you're at risk. OCP is one of the big ones where you're just taking something, and that's a risk factor. Finally, endothelial damage. Because when we have our blood vessels, the endothelium has collagen okay, underneath, on the sub-endothelium. If you damage this endothelium covering the collagen, you're going to expose that collagen, and collagen is part of the clotting cascade. It's going to activate clotting, and you're going to get a blood clot. So what can cause endothelial damage? Things like atherosclerosis, vasculitis, inflammation of these vessels can damage the endothelium and expose that collagen. So again, three major risk factors. Please remember this is super high yield. Disruption of blood flow and blood stasis, hypercoagulable state, endothelial damage all put you at risk for blood clots in general and, and specifically also put you at risk for a DVT. So how will, if you, let's say you get this DVT, how will the patient present? Well, if you remember a superficial thrombophlebitis, remember what I, what I said about that was that was just basically like a mini DVT. That was the blood clots in the superficial veins, superficial thrombophlebitis. And that presented with basically inflammatory symptoms, and so does this. They both present with basically local inflammatory symptoms. So what's an inflammatory symptom? Pain, redness, swelling, warmth. Is that rubor, calor, dolor? Uh, let's see all that stuff pain red it's just pain red redness swelling you always see that inflammation the same thing you see in dvt you're going to see it in the leg either in the calf or in the thigh okay you can also have deep deep veins in the calf as well how do we diagnose this first is the d dimer test now the d dimer test we use to rule out okay d dimer test has high sensitivity but has low specificity okay and the way you remember that remember that high sensitivity test help you rule out stuff and high specificity tests help you rule in. So snout and spin, okay? High sensitivity help you rule out. High specificity help you rule in. This one's high sensitivity. So if it is negative, you are very reassured that the patient doesn't have a blood, have a DVT. If it's a positive test, this does not mean that the patient has a DVT. You do not rule it in yet, okay? You just fail to rule it out. So now you have to do another test. Another test you will do is called a compression ultrasound. This compression ultrasound of the leg can tell you if you have a blood clot. Now, how do we treat this? We have a blood clot. How do you treat this? Blood clot in the leg. Give them anticoagulation. Simple as that. Okay. You can give them heparin. You give them warfarin. And what this anticoagulation does, it doesn't remove this clot. It doesn't dissolve what's already made. It just prevents further clotting, prevents worsening of this clot. Okay. That's something that, that I wasn't really aware of until the clinical times. But anticoagulation doesn't, doesn't melt this clot that you already have. It still sits there. 
but it's going to prevent further clotting, worsening of symptoms, things like that. So that's a DVT. Next, we're going to talk about pulmonary embolism. This is usually, it's again, it's due to a blood clot, but it's usually an embolism. So embolism means a blood clot that travels through the bloodstream and then lodges somewhere. So this one travels through the bloodstream and lodges in the lungs. And usually the source of this blood clot is from the DVT, from deep, deep vein thrombosis of the legs. So this, this clot here will dislodge, go through the venous circulation, or it's probably the wrong arrow, go through the venous circulation, go through the heart, and get sent into the lungs. Okay. Now, if it's a small embolus, this can can often be asymptomatic because the lung has a dual blood supply. It's blood supply from the pulmonary arteries and veins, and it's supply from the bronchial arteries and veins. So, even if you occlude one of those, let's say you occlude the you would occlude the pulmonary artery or, or pulmonary vein, you're still going to get um, blood supply to the lungs from the bronchial arteries and veins. So, it can be asymptomatic, and then over time these small clots will dissolve. However, if you have a large blood clot, then you can cause ischemia of the lungs and infarction of the lungs. And then the symptoms you're going to see are going to be tachycardia, so heart beating fast, and respiratory symptoms. So respiratory symptoms, just, I just mean shortness of breath, chest pain, with breath, especially with breathing, tachypnea, so increased breath rate. Increased breath rate, tachycardia, and then shortness of breath, chest pain are all symptoms of pulmonary embolism. So the other thing is on histology. What you're going to see are lines of Zan, okay? And that's what we see in this picture here. Okay, it's these, these pink lines that, that you see. So these, these pink lines all over here, these guys only form in thrombi form before death. Because, let's say, let's say you die, okay, what's going to happen to the blood? Guess what? It's going to get blood stasis. What was the, what was the risk factors for thrombosis? Well, we're at three. Blood stasis and disruption of blood flow, hypercoagulable state, and endothelial damage. Well, you're going to get some major blood stasis when you die because the heart's not pumping. So all that blood's going to clot. So let's say you had a patient that died. You, you're suspecting he had a pulmonary embolus. How do you know he had a pulmonary embolus is all, if all his blood is clotted up? Guess what? You look on histology and you see these lines of Zan, you know that it, uh, the clot occurred before death and not after. Okay. How do we diagnose this? How do we diagnose a PE? Some, let's say a patient is he has symptoms. What are the symptoms of PE that we said? The tachycardia and respiratory symptoms. For example, shortness of breath, pleur pleuritic chest pain, tachypnea. Tachypnea is breathing fast. Pleuritic, pleuritic chest pain was chest pain with inspiration. How you diagnose this is you give them a CT pulmonary angiography. You you're gonna put in contrast into their blood vessels. And eventually that contrast is going to make it to the lungs. And let's say you have a blood vessel here. If it's if it's blocked by a blood clot, guess what? That contrast is not going to get through. Contrast is going to get stuck, and you're going to see a filling defect. Okay. How do we treat this? Treatment is the same as DVT, so how do we treat this? Treatment is anticoagulation, and remember, it's to prevent further thrombi, further blood clots building up on that emboli, or further just further emboli things like that. And the other thing you can do is you can treat their pain if you need it, or you can give them oxygen if they're short on oxygen. Okay, so that's for, that's for it for DVT and pulmonary emboli. These are pretty high yield topics. Uh, make sure you know them. Finally, we're going to talk about fat emboli, related cousin. So in this case, fat globules are dislodged from bone marrow after a long bone fracture, and these will go into blood vessels, and they're going to end up occluding micro vessels in the lung, central nervous system and skin and this is where they, this is how they're going to cause symptoms they're going to include micro vessels in these locations and they're going to cause symptoms so what symptoms are you going to see obviously you're going to see it's all going to be related to lungs cns and skin you're going to get a triad of neurologic abnormalities so example confusion you're going to get respiratory distress what do we say just respiratory distress in general just shortness of breath pleuritic chest pain they're breathing low faster than usual they're having trouble breathing basically okay because they have thrombi in their micro vessels and then they have these particular rash again that's thrombi in the skin and it's in a patient who recently fractured a lung bone so you get this triad of symptoms in the brain lung and skin in a patient who re recently fractured a lung bone because that lung bone spits out all these fat globules that go into the micro vessels yeah so that's basically fat embolisms so that's it for our embolisms our dvt and pe and fat embolisms